I'm delighted to be joined here today by BBC Economics Editor Kamal Ahmed, giving a talk with the PPE Society on threats to the global economy. Um, it would seem fair to say we live in politically and economically turbulent times. Obviously, the most relevant threat to the UK economy would be that of Brexit um, and the deal the UK secures with the EU. It seems we've reached somewhat of a political standstill with Brexit negotiations. And in your opinion, what seems the most politically viable option for Theresa May to take um, in terms of a Brexit deal? And what is the most economically viable? Are the two the same? Uh, possibly not. Uh, I'll challenge a couple of the uh, assertions in your question, first mm -hmm. of all. Uh, Brexit may not be the most important uh, economic issue for the UK. We have issues around productivity, around people's real incomes, uh, all sorts of uh, incredibly important structural issues with the UK economy, which may or may not be affected by the um, uh, Brexit negotiations. That, that's not for a second to suggest that Brexit isn't important, but I would just challenge that idea that it's the most important thing uh, for the UK economy at the moment. In terms of the politics and the economics of Brexit, I think they can be contradictory. Uh, many economists uh, have argued uh, that leaving the biggest free trading uh, bloc in the world is going to be poor for the economy. We have certainly seen that Brexit uncertainty has affected things like business investment um, uh, in uh, the UK, decision making by firms, the kind of lifeblood of the of the uh, of the UK economy, uh, and there does appear to have been an effect on growth because of that. How much of that is down to Brexit uncertainty and to long-term concerns about Britain's relationship with the rest of the European Union? We will only find out over time. Certainly, the more barriers there are to trade, um, most of the modelling suggests the worse that is for the economy. So that's an important consideration. So economically, what uh, the UK would want, and frankly, what the EU uh, would want is as few frictions as possible between the two sides. Now, we are not going to have a model which is the same as the one we have now, uh, unless we do not leave the European Union, and that would take a huge number of parliamentary hurdles to get over to get to that position. Uh, so let's, um, uh, let's deal with where the government is. Uh, the government has talked about frictionless trade, but there will be some barriers. And as the European Union has made clear, that means there will be some costs to the UK. But the government says that there may be some economic uncertainty at present, but we will have a good trading relationship with the UK. Maybe not as good as we have now, but a good trading relationship with the UK. But there are other advantages, political, which are not about the economy. So, for example, the control of immigration. Uh, is put forward as one of the most important. Uh, the um, freeing of Britain uh, from the rulings of the European Court of Justice is seen as an important part. So the government would argue there are political uh, positives that um, can be, have to be seen in balance with the economic um, uh, issues that may be thrown up by uh, leaving the European Union. And of course it will it'll, it'll be important to see how Britain then does trade with the rest of the world. Um, I, I've always been pretty clear that, yes, Brexit is a huge and important issue, but the bigger issue is what kind of economy does Britain want to be and what kind of um, uh, uh, trading relationship do we want with the rest of the world? The government has said we want to be open Britain, we want to be not about protectionism. And if that approach is taken aggressively, um, then there will be opportunities for uh, the UK, which again play in the balance of some of the uh, economic issues that have been thrown up by leaving the EU. And so you talk about protectionism, and I think we can, possibly not with Brexit, as you've just been talking about, but definitely with the election of Donald Trump and, and num numerous other examples around the world, it would seem emblematic of a shift in trade policy towards protectionism, perhaps. So even liberal progressives, previously having championed free trade, such as Hillary Clinton, have gone back on their promises. Obviously, we've seen Hillary Clinton withdraw her support for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Does this 
worrying turn of events mean we will see a global slowdown in economic growth? Well, at the moment, we haven't seen that effect. We've had um, a lot of noise from um, Donald Trump on protectionism around steel, aluminium, um, white goods, um, washing machines, also solar panels, etc. We've had a pretty aggressive response from China, um, has made a legal complaint to the World Trade uh, Organization. Actually, at the moment, the data show that free trade momentum is still positive. So protectionist um, uh, moves by governments are outweighed by free trade moves. So at the moment, we are still seeing the momentum of, the, of, the, of, of free trade um, increasing uh, global interconnectedness. Now, Donald Trump's argument is that free trade is not really free trade, it's asymmetric trade. It was trade where America wanted to open up the markets of the world uh, towards um, the new consumers of the developing world in particular, and so was willing to open up its markets on an asymmetric, um, in, with an asymmetric balance, and he wants to change that into what he calls symmetric uh, free trade. At present, the amounts spoken about are small in comparison with the global, um, uh, the amount of global trade uh, there is. But as the WTO have warned, as the World Bank has warned, uh, if we go down this route for too long, all the economic models suggest that more protectionism leads to not just lower global growth, but lower growth in nation um, as well. And I think, again, it's similar to Brexit in that it depends what kind of economy you have. Do you make yourself fit for all the new challenges that are coming by simply raising walls to outside competitors, or do you actually change your economy? So if there are no need for steel workers um, in America of a certain type, um, do you then reskill those people? How do you reskill those people to be proficient in another sector? And from an economics point of view, it is better to keep the trade barriers low to allow for competition. I think, though, that what President Trump is up to here is more of a political argument. It's more of that America first issue than it is an economic argument. And I think, ultimately, uh, America knows that it only really succeeds as the world's biggest um, uh, uh, economy by having good, open trading relationships with the rest uh, of the world. And a lot of um, very negative points can be made by the president, but in the end, um, uh, the actual effects of those, I think, will be far less negative than some of the headlines might suggest. Brilliant. And an equally important problem our generation will face is the demographics of our population, both in the UK and worldwide. People are living longer than ever before, a brilliant feat indeed, um, yet this has placed unprecedented stress on our welfare system. How can the government effectively manage an ageing population and continue to experience growth? Will the future entail our generation working for longer and taking shorter retirements? Uh, yes, probably. I mean, it's already entailed. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, when I retire, the retirement age will be 68, um, not uh, 65. Um, I think you're absolutely correct to go back to the idea of um, a short retirement and then you died is clearly not the case anymore. Uh, people, 30, 40 year retirements are pretty common uh, now. We do need to think about how we restructure the economy um, to uh, deal with that, particularly given that one of the ways that very highly developed uh, Western economies have dealt with an aging population and a uh, lower proportion of working people um, in comparison with uh, retired people was immigration. Now, with Brexit, the likelihood, the likelihood is uh, that immigration, certainly from Europe, will decline and um, possibly from the rest of the world as well. And so that creates a, a, another uh, tension in how we deal with an ageing population. Uh, yes, you do need to deal with the tax system. I think you will need to uh, have a look at how people's wealth is taxed. Um, uh, what is it that um, we need to put aside um, to think about our old age? Should that be separate from our general day-to-day -day tax, which pays for education, pays for health, pays for roads, pays for defence, etc.? Uh, and I think those are big debates to be had. But one of the key points here, which is very difficult politically, is it's a very difficult debate to have. And I think that 
there needs to be um, uh, a, a sense that for your generation, mm -hmm. um, there will be a very different model about how you uh, support yourself in partnership with the state for your um, uh, older age. And this is all about a transition between the 20th century and the 21st century. Um, the 20th century, think of my mother's generation, you know, they paid in, they worked, they had one career, they retired, the state supported them in their uh, retirement. That model is pretty much the same for, for, for my generation. Um, but when we come to your generation, I think there will have to be a, a rethink on, um, on uh, how, how, how people are supported in their old age. The problem is, how politically can you get that through the system? And as we saw with issues like tax changes, when Philip Hammond attempted to change the national insurance contributions for the self-employed in the March budget before last year's um, general election, it's very hard to get tax changes through Parliament at the moment. So you have this, this, this growing uh, economic and policy challenge, which is ageing, uh, against um, a political problem of not being able to get tax changes through the Houses of Parliament. And that's a, that's a conversation we need to have as a country. And so many of these issues that we've just been talking about seem to be shorter term threats to the economy. But let's talk about the possibility of the, the more distant future um, of automation and this sort of fourth industrial revolution. So throughout history, people have always been um, put out of jobs from automation, um, yet jobs were always seemingly created elsewhere in the economy, balancing the two out. Yet with the rise of robots and artificial intelligence, the robots themselves can now, can now think for themselves. Could this be the key feature that will fundamentally change the nature of work people perform? And does the rise of robots mean the end of work as we know it? No, it means the change of work. I think you're absolutely right to say that we have often had uh, rather dystopian uh, judgments on uh, uh, the rise of the robots or the rise of technology, putting people out of work. You can go back centuries about this debate. Every revolution, whatever you might describe it, uh, has been based around an argument uh, or, or worry uh, that lots of people will lose their jobs. I'm, I'm no less negative about the fourth industrial revolution um, than I think I would have been about the industrial uh, revolution. Clearly, uh, the rise of robotics and artificial intelligence is going to be a very important part of how we handle the next stage of um, economic growth. Again, it touches on the whole idea of what type of um, economy do we have. Um, there will be less need for repetitive job types, um, what are called middle office, administrative uh, roles. Um, you know, we've already seen the change in checkout staff, uh, for example, which can now be much more mm. automated uh, than it was. But face to face, the 21st century will be about face to face challenges. Your previous question was about um, caring um, and the challenges of an aging population. That's very much a face to face issue. That's very much an issue about how do we care for the generations as they, as they get older. Far harder there to see where AI and robotics completely um, wipe out um, uh, the caring um, uh, professions. Um, so I think we'll have to think about how do we marry um, AI and robotics developments with the kind of society uh, that we want. I'm not bleak about it though. Um, uh, I, I'm lucky, I've, I've been lucky enough to interview Demis Hassabis at DeepMind a few times and I know him a little bit. They are probably at the four leading edge of AI research in the UK. and. And in the world, and the the the, the ability to um, uh, sort and understand um, information and data will be uh, of great benefit to um, our economies, of great benefit to how we understand health, how we understand insurance, how we understand how people live, why people live, uh, how um, how they live. And I think those will be great advantages. So yes, there will be huge challenges. Um, as I say, repeatable tasks will become less less necessary. Uh, but we need to make sure that we have a kind of workforce that's um, skilled in the right way to take advantage of all those things. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And finally, on a lighter note, to students like myself, it certainly appears that we're living through tumultuous times. But over the course of your 25-year career, is this really the case? And are people up to the challenge of tackling them? Uh, no, I don't think it is the case. I think we always say, my goodness me, this is un unbelievable. And, you know, we're in this, this time of, of change we've never seen before. But 
you know, the 20th century was scarred, scarred by world wars. When I was your age, I used to genuinely, or maybe a bit younger, I used to mm. genu genuinely worry that there would be nuclear conflagration. There was the Cold War. Um, there was the collapse of the Iron Curtain. You know, these are big, um, tumultuous events that mark the way the globe and the world um, progresses. I think in life you always have to be lean towards optimism, um, uh, that yes, we are up to it. Um, the human race has survived thus far, um, some damage along, along the way. But yes, I'm relatively optimistic about, about where we are. It will need some very deep thinking. You touched on artificial intelligence. Um, uh, you will know Harari's book, um, Homo Deus, about the future of the human race, says the most important issue facing the human race will be the digital divide. The people who can afford to take advantage of the great digital and technology um, uh, progression that we are looking at at the moment, and those that can't. And it's going to be challenges like that, those big thematic challenges, that are going to be, we, we need to almost lift our horizons a little, I think, uh, it would be those kind of challenges that will be most important for us to successfully navigate, as well as the more tactical day-to-day, year-by-year challenges of our relationship with the European Union, our relationship with America, America's relationship with China. I think that's what's going to be the really important thing for the century ahead, because I think what we're seeing now is the birth pangs of the 21st century, leaving the 20th century behind. So it's an incredibly significant time, but I don't think we need to be overly pessimistic about it. Thank you. Thanks.